this back? I'm not done investigating. What am I investigating? I don't know, you just sat down and started doing that. Huh. Well, to the movie cave. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, 2009, starring the great Nomi Rapaz and directed by Niels Arden Abla. Versus The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, 2011, starring Rooney Mara, directed by David Fincher. Well, there's nothing in there. <laughs> the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo revolves around a journalist who tries to solve the case of a missing woman gone 40 years, aided in his search by Elizabeth Salander, a young computer hacker. Elizabeth, oh, can I call you Elizabeth? I want you to help me catch a killer of women. So, Elizabeth Salander, I think she's an amazing character. I think she's a unique character. She is the reason why I have been very avidly following Nomi Rapace's work. And the thing she really commits to with Lisbeth is you never know what she's thinking or feeling. I was disappointed when I saw the 2011 version because Rooney Mara put a little bit too much stank, a little bit too much attitude on, on Lisbeth. And to me that took the edge away from the character. Uh, I think Nomi Rapace uh, is one of the great actors of the Well, for me personally, I, I liked the stank that she brought. I'm all about the stank. I think it was particularly stanky. She had a very punk rock You're a essence. fan of the stank. Fan of the stank. I think where, Ro where uh, Rooney differs is that she gave more range to the character. Nuomi was very uh, flat. What my problem is, is um, Fincher in Zalian chose to have her pine after Blomqvist. If Lisbeth Salander were a real person, I think she'd be showing up at Steven Zalian's house. <laughs> hey. That is really a betrayal of what I think we like about the original character. Um, you know, because maybe they were less confident that we would still like her even if she's, uh, you know, that we would still like her. This is Bullshit. So Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. What Daniel Craig brought to it specifically, I heard that he actually did research as a librarian to prepare for those things, just getting used to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you would need some experience. Yeah. Dewey Decimal. Uh, looking at pictures. <laughs> But yeah, Craig was probably better. <laughs> Which I, I'll, I'll give, I'll give him that. I'll give Daniel Craig that. Being too lenient on Craig. Yeah. Uh, it's like, yeah, we feel so sorry for you that you've been in this foxhole with Bond for so long that you want to get out and do all these departure roles. Right. But dude, Break come the mold. on. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta think twice sometimes before some of these things. I'm about to get naked back here. So no bacon. I said no bacon. Yeah, no, I think Daniel Craig, specifically with his Mikhail role, he really, he really portrayed this guy who's kind of half given up on life. He's sleeping with his boss. He isn't really in his daughter's life. He's kind of a slob. He's kind of a schmuck. Fincher even told Daniel Craig, like, I know you're in bond shape, but get fat for the role. Meanwhile, this young girl who you're investigating a case with is becoming attached to you. I thought that was very interesting. So wrapping up in terms of the difference in approaches between the two directors, we have Aplev and Fincher. The thing that makes Fincher so Fincher is his relentless attention to detail, really chiseling away at the specific performances that he wants. Where I think the two films really differ are in the montages. There is something very, maybe at times overly dynamic 
about Oplev's style. Oplev's got a very, an old Hollywood approach to his. He does. It's very cross dissolvey newspapers, people typing. And it's funny because both guys, I think, are going for pure information to the audience, but David Fincher was specifically... It's it's earned, you know. Your the characters it's, are earning you gotta the information. Read, you got to read. You got to look at those pictures, man. You got to really stare look at, those at them while you're lying down on the couch. Absolutely. Agreed. We're gonna have like ten of those. <laughs> <laughs> Oplev doesn't have that uh, flair. He doesn't have that version. flair. One thing I always noticed about the 2011 version, somehow he manages to include stark black and white in, ver I think, every shot. It's damn near close. Yeah. But I I always loved, I you know, because I love film noir, and to me, it's not so much a genre as it is a faith. He did something very, very precise and extremely modern for the noir style. So I think I would uh, rate The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo 2009 a solid 8 out of 10. Uh, mainly because of uh, the focus on the character and how uh, the entire technique of the film was done to support the story. For that, I will always forgive its flaws or unevenness there may be. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo 2011, I would give it a... I'm going to be generous and give it a 7 because it is uh, exquisitely well done on an audio-visual level. And that's something that's just objectively true about it. For me, for the 2009... <laughs> for me personally, for the 2009 version of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo... Hey, you're bogarting my takes, kitty. I would give it a solid 7.4 out of 10 for its allegiance to the original novel. So we're doing... Uh, decimals too. Sure, Dude, why not? Yeah. All right. As far as the 2011 version of Dragon Tattoo, I would give that an 8.4 out of 10 for its uncompromising visual style and the way that it really showed some sack in terms of making the novel its own and really within that pushing these characters to new limits. And meow me one more time, bitch. Sink her up. Well, I guess that's all she wrote on our review of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, 2009 and 2011. Sound off in the comments. Thank you. We'll be sure to ignore them. And be sure to like and subscribe for more Geech and Goomba Do Movies. We'll ignore your subscriptions as well. Ah, this isn't... Ah. Yeah. This isn't coffee.